Honda's eighth generation Accord sits somewhere between the Mondeo mainstream and the BMW 3 Series and Audi A4 dominated compact executive sector. No prizes for guessing which segment Honda most wants it to compete in. So is this improved, quieter, cleaner and more frugal version good enough to mix it with the premium brands? The distinction between a Mondeo sized medium range model and an Audi A4 or BMW 3 Series style compact executive saloon is a narrow one. Worse for aspiring brands, there isn't one surefire solution to position their products in the more exclusive of these two market segments. For Audi, it's style. Mercedes uh, focus on luxury, while for BMW, it's driver involvement. And for Honda, well, high tech doesn't have quite the same appeal when it comes to their Accord, especially since many other brands can now match the gadgets we first saw when this model was introduced in 2008. A rethink was needed, along with a lower set of running costs to better suit the mainly business clientele, which is what has brought us to the model that we're looking at here, introduced in mid-2011, the revised 8th generation Honda Accord. Some facelifts completely rejuvenate their products. This isn't one of those. More, it's a package of changes guaranteed to dot the final I and cross the final T on a decision you wanted to make anyway. Namely, to buy something nicer than a, a Mondeo or an Insignia, but without the snob value and ridiculous pricing of an Audi, a BMW or a Mercedes. I always think Accord ownership is very clever for that reason. It's premium brand motoring you don't have to shout about. A motoring that, in the case of this revised model, is quieter, cleaner, more comfortable, even higher tech and more economical. Let's check it out. I always look forward to driving a Honda. Their arrivals with sharper handling or cabins with better aesthetic design or higher quality, but for some reason, especially when it comes to an Accord, there's nothing else in the sector in which I feel as at home. The way the controls work, the way that everything falls to hand, and best of all, the lovely short throw action of the six-speed manual gearbox that makes all others feel notchy and reluctant. You can order this Accord with a five-speed auto with largely redundant gear shift paddles, but please don't choose it until you've tried this self-shifter. You'd be missing out on one of the great individual pieces of automotive design. None of this has changed in the revised 8th generation Accord model, and I hadn't expected it to. Where changes were needed uh, were in terms of running costs, which I'll cover later, and in terms of diesel refinement, which had slipped behind that of obvious rivals. These days, to sell alongside the minority interest 156 PS 2 litre and 201 PS 2.4 litre petrol options, Honda dealers can talk of two diesel models. And it's the grander of the two, a 180 PS version of the 2.2 litre iDTEC diesel unit that I'm uh, testing here. For most Accord buyers though, the default option is the 150 PS version of this 2.2 litre diesel, a, uh, a unit that with 350 newton metres of torque has just 30 newton metres less than this Type S model and it's just a second slower in the 0 to 60 mile an hour sprint at 9.4 seconds. Now in the pre-facelift version of this car, one of the reasons why you might not have wanted to use all of that performance was due to the diesel din offered up at higher revs as well as incidentally at startup. Not good enough from a premium brand wannabe uh, looking to compete in the compact executive sector, hence the considerable effort expended on improving things. Now, without the option of completely redeveloping the engine, the development team concentrated on a combination of small but significant details. High density foam beneath the bonnet, noise insulation under the floor, and uh, sound deadening sheets on the diesel particulate filter and the exhaust manifold. And just in case all that wasn't enough, they thickened the rear window glass too. Out of earshot, out of mind. 
I can't help thinking that it would have been better to have designed a quieter engine in the first place, but there's no doubt that all this effort has really worked. The Accord returned to its position as one of the quietest diesels it's possible to buy in this sector, whatever sector of the market you think that might be. If, as Honda hopes, you see this car as a potential BMW 3 Series like compact executive rival, then you'll be expecting handling to match. Which you won't get, of course, since the BMW drives um, from the rear wheels rather than as here at the front. Still, that never held Audi's A4 back, and this Honda is quite the equal of the Ingolstadt car through a series of twisting turns. Thanks to recent suspension tweaks aimed at better suiting this car to our appalling British roads, there's nothing, save Ford's Mondeo, in the medium range volume class that's better around the bends either. Thanks to this car's low centre of gravity, wide track, rigid body, variable damping, quick ratio steering and supple multi-link rear suspension. There's no one standout feature here, that, but it's a combination of things that creates a very assured drive indeed, if not in most ways an especially memorable one. What you see here is pretty much what you get. Glimpse and accord and you're conscious of something a little more upmarket than the usual medium range Mondeo fare, but not quite as classy as the shapes provided by the prestigious German brands. Now to change that, Honda would have had to do a lot more uh, to change this uh, facelifted 8th generation version than they have. I mean, I'm supposed to know about these things, and even I couldn't see the differences until I asked the press people. If you are interested, in which case you probably need to get out a bit more, uh, the visual changes amount to clear front indicators to flank the BI HID lights that you get on plusher versions with their active cornering lights and an all red light finish at the rear with a chrome finish above the rear license plate. Inside the tweaks are equally subtle. Dark silver interior panels and a bright silver finish for the door handles and the handbrake as well as high quality trim on base versions. Otherwise it's as you were with all the main touch points, uh, seats, steering wheel, pedals, feeling premium, but without the hewn from granite feel that would tend to characterize something German. But for me, that's more than made up for by the exemplary driving position, which sees all the major controls falling beautifully to hand. I say major controls, there are plenty of minor ones, the ergonomic placement of which appears to have defeated the best efforts of Honda's designers. You can see why. Depending on how you count things and how you specified your car, there are from the driver's seat almost 100 different controls within reach, with 16 buttons on the steering wheel alone. In the absence of an iDrive style central controller to get rid of all this button clutter, owners of plusher accords are going to need to spend an awful long time with the handbook first. It's worth it though, for once you take the time to properly understand everything, you can't deny that the thought lying behind it all is really very clever. Take for example the way that the uh, high-tech voice activated satellite navigation is able to recognize the differences between the voices of different sets of users or even distinguish between driver and passenger. The way that high-tech optical sensors are able to determine the position of the sun and adjust the automatic climate control accordingly or the way that the centre console has hot and cold air channeled through it to either cool or warm your drinks. And in the back, well, you might not think it's very spacious if you've just got out of the kind of Ford Mondeo that can comfortably seat three adults back here, but against just about everything else in the medium range and compact executive sectors, it's pretty competitive with room for two adults or three children who can be cooled by their own separate air conditioning vents in plusher models like this one. As for boot space, well, despite marginal encroachment from the rear suspension, there's certainly a little more of it 
in this saloon version than you'd get from something BMW or Audi sized, offering 467 litres and the option of a boot pack to enable you to make the very most of it with things like a cargo net, a side pocket and utility hooks that sit on the underside of the rear parcel shelf here for hanging things like shopping bags. There's also a small underfloor compartment and the option of uh, using these clips to push forward uh, the split folding rear seats and increase more space. A little ironically, the sportier styling that Honda has decided Tourer estate models must have actually creates a smaller boot than this saloon. In the Tourer you get 406 litres, though uh, that's still enough for four medium-sized golf bags or four large suitcases. And of course the advantage with the Tourer is that you can push forward the split folding rear seats to release some more serious space, 660 litres up to window level or 1183 litres if you load up to the roof. And that's enough to put in something like say a mountain bike with all the wheels in place. And most Accord Tourer estates come with an electric tailgate which is a real boon if you're approaching the car heavy laden with shopping. Accord pricing sits in the £21,500 to £30,000 bracket, with a £2,000 premium if you want to move from the 2-litre petrol to the 2.2-litre iDTEC diesel version, and a £1,300 body style premium if you are amongst the 23% of buyers who want to move from this saloon to the Tourer estate model. Now that kind of pricing puts this car a little above uh, Ford Mondeo and Vauxhall Insignia territory and a little below um, compact executive BMW 3 Series or Audi A4 style models. To be a bit more specific, let's take the 2 litre petrol Accord as an example. Now you could save yourself um, a couple of thousand, two to three thousand pounds on uh, a two litre petrol Accord by going for a comparable Ford Mondeo or even Vauxhall Insignia. But in return you get a car that would be less well equipped and blighted by lower residual values when the time came to sell, which would wipe out much of your saving. I think a comparable Volkswagen Passat would be a better match, but the Volkswagen would save you around a thousand pounds and that's a premium I'd be tempted to pay for this Honda's sharper feel. In the compact executive sector, a comparable BMW 318i would be around £1,500 more, but a comparable Audi A4 1.8 TFSI would be nearly £4,000 more. But most Accord customers will be looking at diesel, specifically the 150 PS 2.2 litre i DTEC model. And uh, in comparison to the mainstream, well, you're, you're looking at the same kind of argument. You could save maybe a couple of thousand on a Vauxhall Insignia, a Ford Mondeo, or even a Volkswagen Passat, but you'd end up getting what you didn't pay for. In the compact executive sector, a comparable BMW 318D would be a couple of thousand more, and a comparable Audi A4 2 litre TDI over 5,000 pounds more. Now, whichever Accord saloon or tourer model you end up choosing, the 156 PS 2 litre petrol, the 201 PS 2.4 litre petrol, or this 2.2 litre iDTEC diesel with either 150 or, as in this case, 180 PS, you should find your car to be decently equipped. All Accord models come with alloy wheels, cruise control, climate controlled air conditioning, and the usual power windows and mirrors. You think though that uh, over £20,000 would buy you rear parking sensors and you have to stretch up to a much plusher model before you get satellite navigation. Such plusher versions do though have a lot of the kind of optional high tech you'd find on executive cars from the next segment up. Uh, a good example uh, comes with the bi xenon headlamps that you find on plusher versions like this one that can be specified with active cornering lights that improve nighttime visibility and a high beam support system that automatically dips your headlamps for you at night in the face of oncoming traffic. Then there's the Advanced Drive Assist System, ADAS, which as well as the bi -Xenon headlamps offers three very clever safety systems. The first of these is uh, CMBS, the Collision Mitigation Braking System, able to sense an imminent collision, warn you, and then partially brake if you don't respond. 
ACC or Adaptive Cruise Control keeps you a safe distance from the car in front on the motorway and LKAS, the Lane Keeping Assist System, is able to prevent drowsy drivers from inadvertently switching lanes on the highway. Now all Accord models get Isofix child seat fixings in the rear, anti-whiplash head restraints and uh, six airbags, plus the usual plethora of electronic acronyms to control braking, traction and stability control to hopefully ensure that you'll never have to use them. Honda's almost obsessive attention to detail and fascination with intricate engineering means that this Accord is a car like few others. But if there's one thing that the brand can sometimes stand accused of, it's focusing so intently on the detail that it sometimes loses sight of the bigger picture. I'm not sure, for example, how much resource was devoted into developing the Lane Keeping Assist system, but perhaps before this eighth generation version was first launched, that time and money might have been better spent in producing a more competitive set of fuel figures and CO2 returns. Still, Better late than never, the penny has dropped and this revised model uh, has uh, delivered a far more competitive set of fuel and CO2 figures to grab the attentions of the fleet buyers who will make up over 70% of sales. Achieving these wasn't easy. As with refinement, Honda's designers couldn't intrinsically change what they had, so they had to rely on a whole package of small improvements to make a big difference. We're talking here about a whole host of underbody aerodynamic aids, including a larger front air dam, uh, underfloor and rear subframe cover, and lower friction wheel bearings. No, it doesn't mean a great deal to me either, but what's important is that the results, though hardly startling, are significant. The combined cycle fuel return for the 150 PS 2.2 litre iDTEC diesel manual saloon that most customers choose is up at 53.3 miles to the gallon, while the CO2 return is 9 grams per kilometre better at 138 grams per kilometre. The returns for the 2 litre petrol model are better too, at 38.7 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 168 grams per kilometre of CO2 and there are gear shift indicators on the dash here to help owners get somewhere close to these quoted returns on a normal day-to-day -day basis. Insurance groupings are between 22 and 27 and there's a variable service uh, routine that includes a service indicator that lights up on the dash to tell you when a workshop visit is needed. As for residual values, well, provided you don't stray too far up the range and you resist the temptation to load your car with too many high-tech extras, you should find that by most standards this model does pretty well uh, when the time comes to sell. That's because this car sells in the UK in tiny numbers, with demand fueled by knowledgeable buyers well aware that few cars will be as trouble-free to own as this one. It uh, regularly um, is pitched uh, as the highest model in its class in JD Power customer satisfaction surveys. Uh, for all those reasons, uh, industry experts CAT reckon that after three years and or 60,000 miles, your uh, Accord in a volume version of the uh, 150 PS 2.2 litre iDTEC diesel will be still worth around 32% of what you originally paid for it. Difficult is worth doing was the original advertising slogan for this car. And making the jump from the medium range mainstream to the more premium compact executive sector of the market is certainly difficult. And like other cars trying to do exactly the same thing, uh, Lexus's IS, Volvo's S60, Saab's 93 and Alfa Romeo's 159 to name but a few, this Accord will inevitably be a minority choice here in the UK. Business buyers here are programmed to pay more for something Mondeo sized if it has a BMW, an Audi or a Mercedes badge, but not otherwise. But business buyers can be wrong. For significantly less than you'd pay for something with a premium German badge, this Accord for me is a very smart choice for the clever buyer who doesn't care what others think. The premium you pay over the Mondeo mainstream you'll largely get back at the end of the ownership period, having enjoyed a plusher, higher tech product that'll be more reliable than a Swiss watch. 
and with greater refinement, sharper handling and most importantly lower running costs delivered by this revised 8th generation version, there are now fewer reasons than ever not to factor in this Accord to your buying deliberations. It certainly isn't an obvious choice, but it's one I'm prepared to bet you won't regret making.